think he well, is on, on the slides, but it was kind of technical, and I wanted to uh, have that for you. Um, so if you if you want it, you know, so that I'm going to try to put that in the uh, in a booklet. Certainly happy to see all of you this morning. Glad we can be together and study about Jesus. I'd like for us to uh, briefly review our private readings in the book of Acts. And today is the 19th, which is uh, number 323 on our schedule, Acts 16 and 17. The 15th was Wednesday, so really the 16th, 17th, and then yesterday would take us from Acts 9 to Acts 15, Acts 9. So <clears throat> we are just going to go through pretty quickly. Acts 9 uh, is about what? The conversion of whom? Saul. Uh, Saul of Tarsus. The letter 8 through 12 of Acts is the spread of the gospel after the persecution that arose after the stoning of Stephen. And uh, they went everywhere. You remember verse 4 of Acts 8, preaching the word. And Philip went to Samaria. And so you have, you have some things occurring that's showing uh, really an anticipation of the gospel going to the Gentiles. So in chapter 9, after Saul's conversion, Peter goes to Lydon where he heals Aeneas. Then he goes to Joppa where he raises Dorcas. And then 10 and 11 are significant. 10, we have the conversion of Cornelius first uncircumcised Gentile. That's what's significant. Had proselytes been converted before this time? Yes. Were proselytes Gentiles? Yes. But they had, you know, taken, been circumcised, taken on the form of the law. And then in, in 11, Peter explains his, uh, his whereabouts, what he had done uh, back in Jerusalem to the uh, apostles and elders. And I made the point in our Thursday morning class about this not long ago that there's a lot of ink given over to all of this. Acts, all of Acts 10, and then it's recorded about three different times, even in Acts, Acts 10. Um, and then in Acts 11, Peter goes into detail in order. He says, in order, that's a real significant term. And shows, um, they conclude in the 18, then to the Gentiles also hath God granted repentance unto life. And then there's a picture of what church, what city. And Antioch. Antioch. And Antioch becomes ascending church on the Paul's journeys. And so it's significant insofar as the spread of the gospel of Gentiles is concerned. And then in the last of 11, we have Agabus signifying there would be a great dearth. And uh, it was during the days of Claudius. So the brethren in Antioch, Gentile church, Jews and Gentiles, determined to send a relief to the brethren in Judea, which also they did, sending it by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And so that shows not only the uh, effort to try to um, take care of the need that those people, those brethren had in Judea, but also it would foment goodwill um, in, the, in the ethnic uh, races, the differences between the two. And uh, similar in Romans 15, Paul made that point. So then in chapter 12, what did I say? It was a 15, I should have known that all hand. Yeah, in 12, we have the death of whom? James. James, the brother of John, the imprisonment of Peter. Peter, and then the death of Herod Agrippa I. And then Paul and Barnabas take with them John Mark from Jerusalem up to Antioch. So then in 13 and 14, we have the first what? Missionary, Missionary journey. And it's primarily, primarily dealt with in the Isle of Cyprus and southern Galatia. Uh, they go to Perga, John Mark leaves them in the Perga and Pamphylia, then to Antioch. I we have the first recorded speech there in Acts 13. Then Iconium, Lystra, Derby. Then they begin retracing their steps and uh, appointing elders in every city. Then they come back to the church in Antioch and report what God had done among the Gentiles. Well, there's a problem, though. In 15... There are brethren who are saying that the Gentiles have got to do what? To be circumcised, keep the law of Moses to be saved. So Paul, Barnabas, <coughs> Titus is mentioned in, in, in Galatians 1, 2, rather, not mentioned in Acts. 
but Paul, Barnabas, Titus, and certain others leave Antioch and go to Jerusalem about the matter. They meet, they have a public meeting, a private meeting, then uh, a public meeting again. They write a letter and send it among all the, the disciples saying four things. The Gentiles need to abstain from fornication, things that are strangled, from blood, and from uh, the idolatry. Yeah, and they're kind of all related in a sense, but those were the four things. Uh, it was kind of a sampling of, of really what their, you know, significant or salient pro promise, uh, problems were. Uh, there would be other things as well that the gospel would take care of. All right, and then uh, at the end of 15, we had the beginning of Paul's second missionary journey. And at the end of 15, what happens is Paul uh, wants to see how the churches in Syria and Cilicia were doing, and Barnabas wants to take whom? John Mark. Paul thought it not good to take him who had departed from the work and gone not with him. And so there arose no small dissension. And so Barnabas chose John Mark, who was related to him. You remember what he was? Jan? His nephew. And they went to the Isle of Cyprus. Well, Barnabas just so happens, it's mentioned back in chapter 4, was from the Isle of Cyprus. So he's going back where he had come from, taking John Mark with him. He would have known the area. And then Paul chose Silas and goes through the regions of Syria and Cilicia. And so we have the beginning of the second journey. And uh, Paul, whereas in the first journey, he spends most of his time in Cyprus and then southern Galatia. In the second journey, the majority of his time is going to be spent in chapter um, uh, 18 over the, uh, of the isthmus there in Greece uh, at the city of Corinth for a year and a half. He'll go to other places, Troas, Philippi, the, uh, Thessalonica. Uh, but that's where we'll have most of his work done, at least the lengthier journey. All right, hope you're enjoying the review. And uh, we're, we're in that in our Thursday morning class. If you're able to come, that'd be great. Uh, we're actually recording it. If you want to watch that, uh, you can't come, then you're welcome to do that. We're in John 10 in our study of the life of Jesus. And uh, <clears throat> we want to remember what as much as we can of where we've been we have years of what preparation and uh, then the beginning ministry which you always remember began with what event jesus baptism followed by his temptation early disciples of john are pointed to jesus then uh, we'll skip john 2 and 3. Uh, john is in prison and so jesus and then the pharisees recognize he's making more disciples so he goes northward, and we go to Samaria, the conversation with the woman at the well. <clears throat> and then we have Jesus going to up to uh, Canaan, where he builds the nobleman's son over in Capernaum, goes to Nazareth, where he's rejected. And then he goes to Capernaum and makes it his what? His headquarters. That's right. Home, did you say home quarters? <laughs> his home, yeah. That's what I used to get. There were, in, in Richmond, Virginia, I may have told you about this. If I did, excuse my forgetfulness. But in in uh, Richmond, Virginia, one of the early big box stores for home improvement was called Home Quarters. And it's like a Home Depot. But I, I still kind of think, well, I went down to Home Quarters. You know? <laughs> and it's a very similar to Menards and Lowe's and that kind of thing. Anyway, he made Capernaum his headquarters. And uh, for the better part of how many years? Two. And then, uh, they were bothered, they're following him for many, many of them were following him for wrong reasons. As a result of that, he, we have the periods of retirement. In about four, if you use the word withdraw or he withdrew from the crowds, and uh, uh, there, there's specifics that, that we talked about. And then the time is nearing. Uh, Luke 9.51, if you highlighted that, that'd be a good place to mark, at least in Luke's account that he sets his face toward Jerusalem. And he comes through Samaria, and, and uh, we have that. Then he goes into this area of, um, of uh, Judea, and uh, as well as Perea. Perea means across the river, beyond the river. 
I'm, I made a mistake uh, a couple of weeks ago, two or three weeks ago in the class. I said uh, it meant across the, it, it's always referred to across the Sea of Galilee. I don't know why I said that. I just, I guess I was thinking Sea of Galilee and I said it, but it just means across the river, Perea does, and I had that wrong. So here we are in uh, Luke 10, primarily Luke 951, we, we, we're going toward this closing ministry. Then by the time we get to 10, he sends out the 70 or 72, and then John 7, and uh, we're not going with that. You know, the, uh, we've been talking about 7, 8, 9, 10 of John, and then Luke 10, 11, 12, 13, we talked about that. We're going to fast forward, we talked about the Herod, um, that's mentioned here in uh, Tell That Fox that um, this is in uh, I've got it right here, Luke 13 32 uh, Tell That Fox that I'm doing miracles and cures the next day and today and the next day and the third day I'll be perfected and so uh, uh, all of this now we've come to the Feast of Dedication where uh, in the early part of John 10 Remember, John 10, 1 through 21 seems to go on the heels of John 9 where Jesus healed the man who was born <coughs> blind. And they, uh, eventually the rulers of the synagogue did what to him? Amen. Cast him out. And so Jesus then talks about how, the, you know, you, unless you come in through the sheepfold, through the gate, uh, you're a thief and a robber, and you don't. They don't. Hirelings don't care for the sheep, but I'm the good shepherd. And my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Well, then in 10:22, it says that about that time it was the dedication, the feast of dedication, and Jesus was walking in Solomon's porch, and uh, so uh, we talked about several of the passages there that follow the idea that he had actually begun in the early part of the chapter relative to uh, his being the good shepherd of the sheep. We pointed out that Solomon's porch, you know, I, when I was younger and I read the Bible, I would think Solomon's porch and, and the, our porch at home, the porch of the, 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 you know, the church building where I grew up was about like here here. And you know, eight what ten by fifteen, something like that. And I thought, well, you know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, I guess that's what it was, and it was not that at all. Uh, a portico, a colonnade, and uh, evidently about sixty feet wide here, and, and freestanding roof. Some say about twenty-seven feet high. And Jesus was here. We looked at all that when uh, when we had this speech that uh, that we have recorded here in. Uh, in uh, John 10. Now, the speech in John 10, 22 through the end, or 22 through 39, is actually a debate between Jesus and some of these Jewish leaders. What are they accusing him of being? Anybody? What, uh, what's that, Richard? Yeah, that's right, a blasphemer. He's a blasphemer because he says he is the God's son. And uh, <clears throat> Jesus is saying, well, well, if you don't believe what I've said, believe my works. Uh, the works are from the Father. They testify, they bear witness of me that I am exactly who I claim to be. And that kind of goes back to our overall study of the life of Christ, the two W's you want to remember, the words and the works of Jesus. All validate his deity. Uh, in John 7, you remember when the deputation of soldiers came back and they had been sent to arrest Jesus. He'd been te teaching there in the temple. And then when they got back, the upper echelon of people said, why didn't you bring him? And their answer was, never, never did a man so speak. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, the multitudes were astounded because he was one who spoke with authority, not as the scribes. Scribes would say, well, did Isaiah say? Well, did Moses say? Jesus said, Moses said, but I say to you, I say to you, based on his own credentials. And so his words arrested the uh, attention of the people. And then his works, 
as Brother Gene's mentioned, I mentioned John 3. You want to keep that in the back of your mind. Nicodemus made a great statement of truth. We know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do the works that thou do, and miracles that thou doest, save God be with him. So uh, the, the works, the miracles, validated all of his claims. Did the miracles all through the Bible validate the claims of the speakers? Is that a general truth? Yeah, it really is. Um, many other signs did Jesus in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe. I'm reminded in Exodus 3 and 4 when Moses uh, was remonstrating with God over being sent to Pharaoh. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm slow of mouth, slow of tongue and so on. One of the things God said, you take your rod and throw it down, and what, what did it become when he did? A serpent. And he picked it up by the wrong end, didn't he? God told him to pick it up by the wrong end. What, which end was that? His tail. Picked up by the tail. And uh, everybody knows anything about snakes. No, you always grasp them where? Right behind their heads. Yeah, so they can't reach back and strike you. And uh, anyway, he did that. Then what did it become? a rod and he said through this and then the plagues he anticipated the plagues he will know that I sent you and so in all of the uh, <clears throat> and I made that point guys I think you can too when, when people talk about miracles well the birth of a baby is a miracle no it would be a miracle if a woman had an elephant or if a woman had a chimpanzee that would be a miracle because every uh, every living thing produces after its own kind. Those were natural. Now God set in motion by miracle in the very beginning, but then He set in motion the natural laws of pre procreation. And so a lot of things people attribute to the miraculous are not miraculous these days. There may be astounding. People get who are sick get well, and we're thankful for that. And God can work providentially. But these were specific, um, we might say they were suspensions of natural law. I believe it was an uh, old British writer. Who is it, Lee? I'm thinking about uh, a lot of people like to read after him. C.S. Lewis. Who? Lewis. Lewis. C.S. Lewis, yeah. Thank you. C.S. Lewis, he wrote a lot of good things. But C.S. Lewis was, kind of defined miracle as a suspension of natural law. That's not bad. Jesus walking on water, suspending the laws of uh, gravity, uh, calming the storm, all of those things. Are, they're, 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 what naturally would occur is stopped. Uh, can we raise somebody from the dead? No, but Jesus could. He, he was able to re-impart re life to Lazarus, to Jairus, da uh, uh, the daughter of Jairus, or to the the woman there uh, who had the son or the open casket, the beard. Um, all of those things we don't see today, but they were for the purpose of it. So I, I use all that to come back and say, Jesus said, well, you know, the works that I do, if you don't believe what I say, look at my works. They testify. So let's do this. Let's just kind of read through. And then I want to really emphasize uh, where we got to Wednesday night was Jesus makes a point by quoting from Psalm 82, 6 that, it, uh, that I said, the Lord said, I said, you're gods and sons of the Most High. And then Jesus says, if, if uh, the Word of God came to him and said this, uh, and the Scripture cannot be broken, then how much more is it right for me to call myself the Son of God? That's in essence what he said. I want us to read. <coughs> read with me. Verse 22, it was the feast of the dedication in Jerusalem. It was winter. Jesus was walking in the temple in Solomon's porch. The Jews therefore came round about him and said, How long dost thou hold us in suspense? If thou art the Christ, tell us plainly. We talked about that Wednesday night. Jesus answered, I told you, and you believe not. Uh, you may, it's one thing I did not mention Wednesday night. When Jesus said, I told you, and you believe not, do you have any marginal Bible uh, readings, even in John, that would take you back a few chapters? Yes, there you go. 
536, um, 856, before Abraham was, Jesus said, I am. Uh, all of those statements indicated that he was claiming what? He, deity. He was claiming to be deity. So he said, I told you, and you didn't believe. Now he says, the works that I do in my Father's name, these bear witness of me. I was noticing something that I had not made a point of um, just early this morning. The Father and my Father are emphasized. The works that I do in my Father's name. You see that in verse 25? These bear witness. When Jesus said, my Father, he is speaking of a unique relation that he had to God. Now, in the model prayer, Matthew 6, he said, pray after this mountain, pray after this manner, our Father who art in heaven. But when he was speaking specifically about his relation to God, he said, my Father. A little later, when uh, Mary will see him in the garden after his resurrection, she, uh, Jesus will tell her, go tell the disciples that I have not yet ascended to my God and your God, my Father and your Father. He made the distinct difference there. All right, so just notice that as you read. My Father, the Father. Uh, verse 26. But ye believe not because you're not of my sheep. Their refusal to believe excluded them from his sheep. But my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And we talked about that. Uh, as long as we hear the Lord's voice and we follow him, we, we are his what? We are his sheep. Uh, does that mean it's impossible? He goes on to say, and I gave, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. Impossibility of apostasy? Is that what he's teaching? No. As long as we hear the voice of the shepherd and follow him, then we uh, we won't part. But as as we if we don't, then we're no longer his sheep. My father, here's your far phrase again. My father, who hath given them that is disciples the sheep unto me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the Father are one. Now that stops Jesus' statement at this point. And what was that, Brother Charlie? Just came through. Okay. Then, then here's the reaction. The Jews took up stones again to stone him. And then Jesus responds. He said, Many good works have I showed you from the Father. Or does your translation say my Father? Yours does Lee? Does that that's the New King James? Uh, New American Standard says what? My Father or the Father? The Father. The, father. the American Standard. King James says the Father, doesn't it, Richard? My Father. Okay, so there's some differences on the manuscripts. These have I showed you from the Father or my Father. For which of those words do you stone me? All right, I've done a lot of good deeds among the people, miraculous in nature. Uh, for which do you stone me? <laughs> then their answer. Jews answered, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou being a man makest thyself God. They, you know, some of the Muslims argue that Jesus never did claim that he was God's son. Even the enemies of Jesus during his life understood that, didn't they? They understood, yeah, he's claiming to be deity, God's son. So he answered them, and here's where we, we wanted to spend a little time. It, they, they just accused him of blasphemy. So here's his answer to that. Is it not written in your law, I said, you're gods? If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and then parenthetically he says, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I'm the Son of God? Question. Some of you may have a, a period at the end, but it's actually a question. Are you saying, since uh, even in your own law, it said th th concerning judges and, uh, among the people that they were gods, little g there, not, not uh, capital G. If that's the case, then all the more right for me, who, whom the Father has <coughs> sanctified or set apart and sent, to 
apply the name Son of God to myself? If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do them, though you believe not me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I in the Father. Which basically goes back to explain verse 30. I and the Father are one. Well, what was the response to that? They sought to what? Take Him. They, the Father. they sought again to take Him, and He went forth out of their hand. Keep reading. He went away again beyond the Jordan into the place where John was at the first baptizing. And there He abode. And many came to Him, and they said, John indeed did no sign, no miracles. But all things whatsoever John spake of this man were true. And many believed on Him there. All right. <clears throat> what I'd like to do is finish up on our questions here. Then I want us to look at some slides. <coughs> Number, I think we got down to H, did we? Did y'all mark uh, H Wednesday night? Uh, I thought so. H on page 33. Jesus responded that he had done a number of good works and made them understand that if they stoned him, it would be for such. How did they respond? Not for what? Not for a good work, but for blasphemy. Yeah, blas 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 blasphemous uh, is a basically a transliterated word. So basically that in the Greek. It means to, to, to speak against, to rail. And it can be used to deny uh, God um, of the rightful place he has. It can sometimes be used to elevate uh, man to a position of deity. That's blasphemous. And that's how the Jews here used it in the last part. Uh, they, they thought he, being a man, made himself God. All right, uh, I, in verses 34 through 6, Jesus shows his right to be called God's son based on their own law. He said that even in their law, civil rulers were regarded as God's delegates or ministers. And as such, they were called gods. Notice the little g. If the law called them gods, since the word of God came to them, how much more should Jesus then be given a title of God's son to which he had a better right, even in the subordinate sense of being a mere messenger? There was power to this argument because both Jesus and even his enemies understood that the scripture cannot be broken, meaning it cannot be set aside. Jesus next tells them that even if they do not consider his words, they had to consider his works which should testify that the Father was in Him and He was in the Father. You know, there's some uh, uh, bright, <laughs> and I use that with a, in quotations, bright people who think, well, see, that just shows that the Bible can't be true. How could one person be in another and another person be in the other? How could that be? He's not, he's not talking about some kind of a, a inexplicable idea of one swallows the other and the other swallows. I've even seen that illustrated. And the one swallows the other and somehow he's in one and the other's in it. It just means that they're what? They're completely what, John? One. They're co completely one. Unified is the idea. They're in complete <coughs> unity. That the Lord on earth did absolutely nothing that wasn't what the Father's will was for him in heaven. That there was that agreement between the two. Um, United Pentecostals teach there's one person in the Godhead that is Jesus only. Now, the name of Jesus is the Father, the name of Jesus is the Son, and the name of Jesus is the Holy Spirit. That's how they kind of get around Matthew 28 19. And the truth of the matter is, that's not the case. When Jesus was baptized, here his body is in the water. The voice from heaven said, This is my what? Beloved Son. Well, then what came and hovered or abode on him in the bodily form of a dove? The Holy Spirit. You've got the personality in heaven uh, coming through the clouds, the Spirit descending in some kind of a, a visage that they could see, and then Jesus in bodily form. Um, and uh, Colossians 2.9, we've used that passage so much. In him, speaking of Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So he's, he is God, but he's not God the Father. He's God, but he's not the Holy Spirit. 
but he's God nonetheless. He's a part of the Godhood. The word Godhead is used throughout the King James three times in the New Testament. But I think the word Godhood um, is better understood. We know neighborhood. What's a neighborhood? It's a hood where it's an area where people are neighbors. What about motherhood? It's the status of being what? A mother. Fatherhood, status of being a father. Statehood, the um, status of being, being a state. Uh, any type of the word hood is used, it, it, is, it describes the status. Godhood describes the status of being God. Not God the Father, but God nonetheless. And so the, the, he's deity, we would say. All right, comment, question? Exactly. Exactly. Because it was just like <coughs> it was just like they were so intertwined. There is no discrepancy between the two. Exactly. What 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 you it, the the will of the Father in heaven was completely carried out to every instance by the Lord on earth. Uh, uh, in John five, he argued that that uh, I uh, of myself, he said, I do nothing but what I see of the Father. And so you have that unity. I think a lot of people in the world don't understand that. They, they, they think, well, Jesus was this neat guy who came to earth and kind of social revolutionary, and a lot of people didn't like it, so they killed him. And they don't understand. Yeah, he was a man, and he was crucified, but he was God's son. And he reflected everything that we need to know about God in human form. Yeah, again, just keep in your back of your mind John 1.18. No man has seen God at any time. That is the Father, all the aspects of His deity. But the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, He hath what? What? He, he, hath, beheld, he hath revealed Him or declared Him. Look, look at that. Look, at, look up in your Bibles. Tell me what your word says. He hath what? Or has Declared, revealed, explained. Aren't those words that you find? That's John 1 18. David, you're looking at yours. Who, who's got it? Read, you have yours. Uh, explained. The word explain is a synonym. Declared, revealed. All of those are, are, are from the same Greek word, and they just say that they just mean that he has um, expressed who God is. He is the, it, oh, you know, I start thinking about so many things that I don't think about when I'm preparing for class. In Hebrews 1, those passages all of us need to memorize. Uh, God having of old time spoken unto the fathers and the prophets by divers portions and divers matters, hath in these last days spoken to us in His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, by whom also He made the worlds who being the effulgence or the brightness of His glory and the very image of His person. The very image of His person. He is the express image of God. And so if we ever wanted to know what God is like, we look to the life of Jesus. So He is the, the final, God's final appeal in all matters. Does it make sense to everybody? Okay, now, I want to, you've got this on your paper, but I wanted to look at it. Uh, let's go back. Read, first of all, read with me 34, 5, and 6. Jesus' response to those Jews who claimed he was blasphemous is, Is it not written in your law? I said, You're gods. If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. Say ye of him whom the Father sanctified and sent, speaking of himself, thou blasphemest, because I said I'm the Son of God. <coughs> what I'd like to do, keep your finger there, or just forget about it, and then turn all the way over to Psalm 82. This is the passage from which Jesus quotes, Psalm 82, verse 6. He's talking to Lee on the way over here. I've, I'm not... To, you probably say, well, that's good that, you know, 25 minutes in the car, you at least spoke to your wife. <laughs> but uh, talk to her about this. I, you know, I've read uh, quite a bit on these passages, but I've never seen a person, well, I'll, I'll talk about this in a minute. 
Uh, do you have a, a like a caption or topical reading of Psalm 82? What does it say? Was that brother? Un unjust judgments rebuked. Yes, unjust judgments rebuked. And the point that he makes is that you have judges among you, rulers among you, and they are supposed to rep uh, represent God and God's will among you. And so what he does, Asaph, the writer, says, God stands in the congregation of God or the congregation of the mighty. The, and do any of your translations say something else? The judges? Does it say the judges? He judges among the gods. What's that? He judges among the gods. He judges among the gods. Yes, little g. It's the, we'll get to this in just a second. Elohim, but it's used in the sense of these uh, magistrates or leaders. He judgeth among these magistrates, leaders. And some of your translations would, would pose that. Now, how long will you judge unjustly? Well, how are they doing that? And respect the persons of the wicked. That is, people who are wicked and cantankerous, you let go. Verse 3, judge the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and destitute. Rescue the poor and needy. You're not doing any of that. Deliver them out of the hand of the wicked. You've not been doing any of that. The, and here's the reason. Uh, some have said verse 5 is like the centerpiece of the song. They don't know. They know not. Here, who are we talking about? The leaders, the judges, who are called gods with a little g. They know not. Neither do they understand. They walk to and fro in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. In other words, they have no clue what they should be doing or how they should be judging. Then our passage. God now says, I said, you're gods. Who is the one who called them gods or leaders? God. God said. And all of you sons of the Most High. In other words, you would not have your position exalted though it may be unless I gave it to you. And yet you are corrupt. You're not doing what, I, what my will is. You're not representing me as you should. Nevertheless, though you're puffed up and proud, you will die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all the nations. So Asaph ends the psalm by calling on God to judge all these wicked judges. Now, I've got some things I wanted to share with you about all that. Jesus quotes verse 6 of that psalm where, he, where God says through Asaph, I said, you're gods. And all of you sons of the Most High are sons of God. And it's applied to unjust judges or leaders among the Jews. See similar use of the word God. Now, I want us to do that for just a second. We may run out of time. Turn over to Exodus 21. All of your thinking... Okay, I know Exodus 20 is the giving of the Ten Commandments. 21 through 23, applications of it. 24, ratification. I look at 21. In 2 through 6, here's a servant who is married, has children, and he wants to be a servant of his master forever. And so he comes, verse 5, If the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto, what does your translation say? Judgment. Any others? Uh -huh. To the judges. Did anybody say to, unto God? With a, doesn't the New American Standard, Charlie? Verse 6. Have, yes. Have God, and then it has a marginal reading for the judges. English Standard uses God. God, yeah. I, I had, Capital G. I, yes. <clears throat> they'll bring him unto God and shall bring him to the door unto the doorpost or so. That, well, they didn't bring him unto God as a being, but they brought him unto the judges, these magistrates, where uh, some arbitration would be done. 22.8 and 22.28. The footnotes and the number of Bibles indicate that. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised more of your Bibles don't say that. Most of the ones I had, there's a a little, and even in uh, blueletterbible.org, if you want to look that up, it has even in the various translations a little, a little, um, what do you call that? Landon's kind of a little, um, 
leak, leak. a little leak. Yeah. And you can touch on that and it will go immediately to mo what most of the footnotes are. But anyway, it, it's really explained in Deuteronomy 117. Look, look at this. Deuteronomy 117. I, I'm just getting you to see how the word is sometimes used to describe leaders among God's people. <clears throat> That's the main point. Deuteronomy 1, whoever has it first read it. shall not show partiality in good. You shall fear the small and the great alike. You shall not fear man of the judges is God's. The case is too hard that the case that is too hard for you, you shall bring it to me, and I shall hear. Yes, but who who would they bring it before? The judges. And and yet God says it's before me. But it would be through his representatives on earth. And so really in that passage and also in Matthew 17 is almost an explanation. The word God is from Elohim, which is a plural masculine noun. And uh, I quoted from Strong, God's in the ordinary sense, this is just a part of his definition, but specifically used in the plural thus, especially with the article, like it is the God or the God's of the spring God, occasionally applied by way of deference to magistrates, as in Exodus, that's the passages up here, and Psalm uh, 82. That's my, I hated, that's not a quote, that's my explanation. And sometimes as a superlative, speaking of angels, exceeding great judges and money. And then Brown Driver breaks it, rulers, judges, either as the divine representatives at sacred places or as reflecting divine majesty and power. A comment on 82, uh, Psalm 82, verse 1. Now go back to that real quickly. Uh, you remember where he said that he stood in the congregation of, of God. Uh, God standeth in the congregation of God. He judgeth among the gods. A comment on that is, I have given you this title. I have conferred on you an appellation which indicates a greater nearness to God than any other which is bestowed on men. An appellation which implies that you are God's representatives on earth. And that your decision is, in an important sense, to be regarded as his. In other words, God's idea was, when these magistrates or judges spoke, they were giving whose will? God's, God's will itself. That's from Barnes. Therefore, Jesus rebuttal of their charge of blasphemy from 82.6 is essentially this. If these judges were called gods and sons of the Most High, as distant representatives of God, how much less did Jesus blaspheme, which they accused him of doing, in taking to himself a title to which he had a greater right than they, even in the subordinate sense of being a messenger? Or, reasoning from lesser to greater, if these judges were called sons of God, then Jesus is all the more the Son of God, the one whom the Father, as he said, sanctified and sent into the world. So that's how Jesus answered them on their own turf. Another idea and the scripture cannot be broken. Uh, that's, that's stated parenthetically. Uh, the, the, the word cannot is not C-A-N and then another word N-O-T, but it's one word, cannot. That means it's an impossibility. Like you cannot serve God and mammon, Matthew 6. It's an impossibility. The, and the scripture cannot be broken, loosened, breaking commandments. Uh, not only infringing, but losing the force of them, rendering them not binding. It meant that it cannot be set aside or undone. This is significant from several points of view. Even his enemies agreed to this. While they did not keep the law, they agreed to that proposition. Hence, Jesus answered them on their own turf. Second, Jesus' use of the Scripture refers not merely to that. When he, when he says, Psalm 82 says this, and then he says, and the Scripture cannot be broken. That just means this is one of, one of what? The scripture. All Scripture. One of all. Yeah. The entire group of writings of which that one verse was a part. And I think another point. Jesus obviously believed in the complete inspiration of all Scriptures as shown from this passage. <clears throat> For him, the first rule of understanding God's Word is this truth that the Scripture can't be broken even to what might be considered remote expressions of the, of the written word. Jesus began and ended with this. And uh, I found a quote that I thought was good. What he believed, let us receive. What he respected, let us revere. 
And a, another thing, the fourth thing here, this phrase also argues for the infallibility of the word on every ground, whether doctrine, history, or science. What is said, the Bible impartially interpreted and judged is free from demonstrable error in its statements, harmonious in its teaching to agree with itself. It creates the irresistible impression of a supernatural factor in its origin. In other words, the Bible for all of this indicates it could not be a product of a man. It has to be a product of God. The scripture cannot be broken. Uh, I, we don't have time for the other. You've got it on your paper. Lord willing, we'll uh, maybe talk about it a little bit Wednesday, then go on into uh, Luke 14. Comment or question is we're closing down.